Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Let's pray as we open God's Word. Lord, thank you for bringing us here today, whether we're able to be in the room or tuning in from home or somewhere else. Bring us completely into your presence. Open our eyes and our minds. Help us to hear your call and see how it connects with our lives today and be willing to follow you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, today in the Gospel of Luke, we come to an aspect of faith that goes largely overlooked in the modern church, the second coming of Christ. Think about it. If you've spent your life in the church, how often has Jesus' return been talked about? We could ask it another way. In your experience, has the church spent more time talking about what has happened in the past or what will happen in the future? I think we've definitely majored on the past. However, while majoring on the past, we seem to have overlooked the fact that the earliest believers were mostly focused on the future. The Old Testament prophets always looked forward to what they called the day of the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill, let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. The New Testament writers had similar warnings. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Have you ever heard of a first century book called the Didache? It was one of the earliest manuals of Christian worship and practice outside the New Testament. Didache means teaching. So it's kind of the earliest Christian teaching on how to be a Christian. And it's a great example of how the first generation of Christians lived out their faith. The Didache also has a keen focus on the future return of Jesus. Watch over your life. Do not let your lamps go out and do not keep your loins unbelted, but be ready for you do not know the hour when our Lord is coming. Meet together frequently in your search for what is good for your souls, since a lifetime of faith will be of no advantage to you unless you prove to be responsive, fully responsive to the very end. Sounds like archaic language, talking about lamps and belted loins and that kind of stuff, but that's actually, those are actually quotes from the passage that we'll look at today. Why were all these Christians in the past so focused on living each day with a view toward the future? Because that's what Jesus talked about. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and we'll come and wait on them. As we've seen several times already in Luke, the so-called parables of Jesus take many forms. So the longest ones are involved narratives with characters and plot and that kind of stuff. The shortest ones might just be a simple metaphor, one or two words. And Jesus kind of mixes them freely as he goes. That's what he's going to do in today's passage. He starts with two metaphors. When he says, be dressed and ready for service, the literal translation is, keep your loins girded. 
It meant gathering up the long folds of your robes and tucking them into your belt so that your legs would be free for action, especially for running. I find sometimes in the first service, you know, I wear my robe and I have to kind of hike it up if I want to go up the stairs. You know, it's kind of, kind of like that. That's the idea. So, the other image Jesus uses is keep your lamps burning. Some scholars have seen in this a reference to the altar in the temple. The Old Testament law said, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. The idea seemed to be that they needed to remember the presence of God at all times by keeping the fire burning, ready for its purpose. So what is the lamp that Jesus wants us to keep burning? The light of the gospel, the truth of his message. Now, if the altar in the temple burned wood and lamps burned oil, what is the fuel to keep the gospel burning? People. Every time someone hears about the love of God in Christ and puts their faith in Him, the fire of the gospel keeps burning a little longer. But if we stop sharing that message, if it seems too embarrassing to talk about, too intrusive, too old-fashioned, too personal to actually bring up in our day-to-day lives, if for any reason we stop sharing the message of the gospel, it will go out. So Jesus says, keep your lamps burning, keep your robes hiked up, ready for action, by being faithful to what I've told you to do. Then he uses a series of little mini-stories to sort of illustrate what he means. Now, before we get into these stories, I have to say, the characterizations that Jesus uses usually seem harsh to us. He's going to use the images of slavery, robbery, intoxication, and even violence. Beatings and maimings and that kind of stuff. As part of the way of explaining spiritual reality. But before we respond that these metaphors are too graphic and disturbing for our modern ears, there are a couple things I think we should remember. First, they weren't any less disturbing in their original context. If anything, the people who first heard Jesus would have been impacted even more by what he says. For them, things like slavery and violence were not hypothetical ideas. They saw them every day, all around them. Many of them were slaves themselves and victims of violence. And second, these are metaphors. Jesus isn't endorsing slavery any more than he's endorsing thieves. Instead, he's trying to illustrate spiritual realities. So he uses things that we can understand, things that get our attention, and shows us how they're similar in certain ways to what faces us in the life of faith. So he says that the readiness we need to have and maintain in faith is like servants waiting for their masters to return from a wedding banquet. If servants want to be rewarded, then they need to keep watching in readiness to serve as long as it takes. But here, even as he uses slavery as a metaphor, at the same time he radically reimagines it. Most of Jesus' parables have a weird part. A part where someone acts completely out of character in an unexpected way. And usually, that's where the main spiritual point can be found. So whenever you read the parables of Jesus, always look for the weird part. That's usually the most important part. So, what is the weird part in this passage? It's when the master trades places with the slaves. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve... And we'll have them recline at the table and we'll come and wait on them. Weird. I mean, that never happens, right? Actually, it has happened before. Do you remember the story about Jesus washing the disciples' feet? Serving them the bread and the cup? What about feeding the 5,000 and healing people and encouraging and comforting people? Later in Luke, Jesus will say it this way. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. 
There is a master who intentionally takes the place of the servant. It's the one who's telling us these parables. That word serves is the same word that Jesus uses in our passage. The Greek word is diakonia. Does that sound familiar? Diakonia. It would provide the name for one of the first offices created in the church, the deacon. That's what deacons are. People who serve the needs of the whole community. Serve like Jesus serves. So when Jesus uses the image of a servant, one whose sole purpose is to fulfill the will of the master, Christians don't take that as an insult. This servanthood is very different than how that institution played out in human cultures through the centuries. These servants serve voluntarily. And the one we serve values us more than his own life. He didn't buy us with money. He made us. And then he bought us back with his own blood. And even then, he will only accept our service if it's given. And he has this strange habit of serving us. In some ways, more than we serve him. And an even stranger habit of turning servants into sisters and brothers. So this kind of servanthood is different. Jesus continues to describe it in verse 38. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. Ancient culture divided the nighttime, which was 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., into watches. For the Jewish people, there were three watches that were each four hours long. So you had the first watch, the second watch, the third watch. One early Christian commentator, Cyril of Alexandria, had an interesting interpretation of the watches of our lives. With us, there are three ages. The first is childhood, the second is youth, the third is old age. Whoever is found watching and well belted, whether by chance he is still young or has arrived at old age, shall be blessed, for he will be counted worthy of attaining to Christ's promises. Now part of what we don't like about Cyril is we're like, you know, what about middle age? Went straight from youth to old age, whatever. But still, <clears throat> The concept is we have different seasons of life. And in which of those seasons are we to serve? All of them. Cyril may be on to something. How many of us have thought to ourselves, you know, when it comes to serving, I've kind of done my time. You know, I served in a lot of ways earlier in my life. Uh, I, I did VBS, I did Sunday school, I was in the choir, whatever. But now... I'm kind of retired from all that active serving stuff. Or we may look forward to a time when we can retire from actively participating in service. Cyril of Alexandria seems to think that faithfulness in serving isn't measured by decades or seasons, but by lifetimes. Jesus seems to talk the same way. And why does Jesus say that we need to continually serve and be ready at all times? Because we don't know when the end will be. Verse 39. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. In all the information we have in the New Testament about the second coming of Christ, which is not that much, but in all of it put together, we are never told when he's coming. What we're told over and over is that he's coming, and so we need to stay ready all the time. The first part of this section has been for all Christians, how we all have to learn to stay ready all the time. The second half is aimed specifically at leaders in the church. Verse 41. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. 
Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Jesus answers Peter's question with another story. But this time, it's not just about servants, but managers who are given responsibility over the other servants. In a minute, Jesus will describe these people as knowing the master's will. These are leaders in the church. People who've been entrusted with shepherding and nurturing people in faith. And here's the thing about Christian leaders. None of them are perfect, but some of them do a great job at fulfilling their role. They faithfully administer the grace of God to the people that they serve. The people in their care become more and more like Jesus over time as they challenge them and encourage them and equip them to serve in the kingdom. Some Christian leaders are awesome. I've known a few in my time. You've probably known some in yours. And Jesus says that he will reward their faithfulness. But you know what? Some Christian leaders are not awesome. Instead of faithfully administering their calling, they abuse it. Instead of serving their congregations, they exploit them. Jesus has something to say to these too. Verse 45. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on the day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. One of the greatest tragedies of abusive ministry, in addition to all the people who are hurt along the way, is that many of those people will blame not just the minister, but the church as a whole, or even God. So I hope we hear what Jesus is saying here. First of all, he doesn't pretend that all Christian leaders are good or that they're all the same. They aren't, and he knows it. And secondly, he is not okay with that. He is not okay with abuse or greed or exploitation or hoarding and lording power. He pronounces some of his strongest judgment of all on people who misrepresent God. So if you have been hurt in the past by people in positions of church leadership, as many people have been, I think I can speak for the rest of the church when I say, we are so sorry. That is never what the church was intended to be. But please don't let don't hold that against the whole church or against faith or against God. Please don't let the sin of a few people, as wrong and terrible as it was, please don't let that rob you of all that God has for you in the community of faith. You need the church and the church needs you. If for no other reason than to make sure that none of that bad stuff ever happens to anyone else ever again. The church is only going to be as good as we make it. And we need all the help we can get to make it more like Christ. As Jesus continues to talk about the judgment that will fall on those who misrepresent God, he makes an important distinction. Verse 47. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. In other words, the more we know, the more responsible we are for responding to what we know. And the smart aleck nitpicky part of us might respond by saying, then wouldn't it be better to try to avoid spiritual growth? I mean, if we're going to be held responsible for what we know, then shouldn't we just try to avoid knowing? But that approach has been effectively shot down centuries ago. Augustine put it this way, Yet we must not on this account take refuge in the darkness of ignorance so as to find there an excuse for our conduct. Not to know is one thing. Unwillingness to know is another. There's no fooling God. God is aware more than we are of what we know and what we don't. 
But in the end, we won't just be judged based on the knowledge that we have, but on everything we have. Jesus finishes here with one of his most wide-ranging pronouncements. From everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Given much, entrusted with much, by whom? By God. God is the one who gives us our blessings. Much will be demanded, much more will be asked. Asked by whom? Again, by God. Let's face it, compared to most people in the world, compared to most people who have ever lived, we have been given much, entrusted with much. No matter how you want to measure it, we have the most. Whether it's time, our lives last longer. Material resources, we have more. Privilege, we have more. Knowledge, freedom, Whatever measure you want to use, we have been given much. Which means we really have no excuse not to live as faithful servants of our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, when we stop to pay attention, we do recognize that we've been given much. And we can see, even in our own lives, how that might not draw us to you, but be a wall that separates us from you. That the more we have, the more we can get tricked into thinking that we can just exist on our own, that we don't need you. But we ask that you show us with conviction and clarity where we really stand that all these things you've given us don't have to draw us from you, but can instead be used in faithfulness for you. Show us the ways that our blessings can be part of how we serve. We ask these things in your name. Amen.